Hi and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about plasticity models and specifically a type of plasticity model that's called combined hardening plasticity. So a finite element program has a lot of different plasticity models and they have been around forever and sometimes they can be useful. Um, there are different kinds of plasticity models obviously. We have isotropic hardening plasticity, we have kinematic hardening plasticity, and the type of model I want to talk about today is what I think is the most interesting one, which is a combined hardening which has a little bit of kinematic hardening and a little bit of isotropic hardening a little bit of best of the both worlds basically and that's what i want to talk about here today how does this work when can you use it and and should you use it basically and uh, i will keep in mind that i'm focusing on polymers in some sense so i will talk a little bit about how this applies to polymers too and uh, people have used that for a long time for polymer predictions plastics etc and they can be useful but can also have some limitations and i will talk about that here in this video so let's start with the most basic plasticity model which is called isotropic hardening plasticity this is a kind of plasticity model where you do a tension test on a specimen uh, you pull on it you get the stress strain curve and then you basically fit a piecewise linear representation of that curve into a plasticity model. So it's very easy to use. You get a very good fit to one curve. And this is what people usually just call the plasticity model. The problem here is that you can obviously capture the monotonic response very well since the piecewise fit to it, but the unloading response you can't fit to. And it's just some kind of prediction that comes out of the model. And this is uh, the red curves here, are experimental data for ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. A polyethylene with really long molecules and the unloading predictions are terrible, as you can see. So it's well known isotropic hardening plasticity, the traditional plasticity should not really be used if you have unloading or cyclic loading. It doesn't work very well. It has this very odd unloading response where reverse plasticity occurs at the same stress magnitude as you ended up here in the first time. So that's the problem. Now, the way to overcome this is to switch on to kinematic hardening or perhaps combined hardening as we'll talk about. So kinematic hardening is a little bit different, right? So here's a, a example, the stress strain curves are loaded up to this point where plasticity starts and they start rolling over, which is what we typically see experimentally. And then we unload. And what we see now is really interesting is that the reverse plasticity starts here somewhere. And that is about twice the, the initial stress here. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But you get much nicer unloading predictions, much more realistic to similar to what we see when we test thermoplastics, for example. And this is a, a multi-network, backstress network, kinematic hardening plasticity model. So that's a, a really interesting and exciting. Now, what is combined hardening plasticity? Is this something where you combine these two things together? In isotropic hardening, yielding the yield surface is a key phenomenon and it really says that when the yield the, the MISA stress uh, is the same as the yield stress then plasticity occurs and the yield stress for isotropic hardening plasticity can be a function of the plastic strain and uh, for kinematic hardening plasticity you have this um, back stress this is the alpha tensor here so the deviatoric stress minus the back stress and you take the Mises uh, effective stress out of that difference, when that becomes equal to the yield stress, then you get plasticity. So when you have combined hardening, both the back stress and the yield stress can be functions of the plastic strain, and they don't have to be the same functions. So you can get this interesting evolution of the stress strain curve uh, by doing that way. The, the evolution of the back stress is, is often represented by this equation. And, uh, Here's the time derivative of the back stress, and it depends on the current value of the stress, the current back stress, the plastic strain, and two material parameters called C and gamma. In this case, we are allowing it for multiple back stress networks, uh, and uh, that's why this is a subscript I on these. So these are the material parameters you need to find from experimental data using something like M calibration uh, that I will show later. Same, same time, you often like to introduce the isotropic hardening plasticity in, in abacus, as an example, this can be specified using cyclic hardening uh, keyword. And then you activate this equation that shows you how the yield stress evolves to the plastic strain using an initial constant, sigma y0, and then another material parameter is q infinity, and then b is a third material parameter. 
And this equation, what does this do? Well, if we look at the limit as the plastic strain goes to infinity, this becomes equal to the initial value plus the saturation limit. The rate at which it approaches this value is given by uh, the B parameter. So this is how this kind of thing works in that case. To visualize this, I think it's sometimes very nice to just show a graph like this to better understand and show how this works. So the figure to the left is stress strain for different gamma values. So I kept every parameter the same except gamma. And I used the M calibration parametric study for this. Gamma here, if you have a very high gamma, then you get a rapid uh, uh, approach towards the steady state value. So high gamma, rapid approach to the steady state stress. Otherwise, it will just take a long time, and therefore the stress will rise more. The C parameters controls the initial modulus after yielding, so a low C value gives you a low slope here, and then it goes up as the C value increases. So that's a kinematic hardening modulus in some sense. And the point here is that you want to have multiple of these kinematic hardening back stress networks. So you superimpose some of these together, that gives you more of a smooth curve anyway. So you can combine these together, and that gives you better predictions. I, I like this uh, also to, to talk about in terms of loading and unloading curves. This is a very good mental picture of what's going on with these plasticity models. So I'm going to start by having this picture for isotropic hardening plasticity. So this is stress strain graphs. And the origin is here in the middle. And I took this specimen, I pulled it out to about 40% strain. I, the stress went up to this point here to about 25 megapascals. And then I unloaded it and I get a total linear elastic unloading until I get reverse plasticity down here. So you can see the, the symmetry here between tension and compression, which is what you get for isotropic hardening plasticity. And as I mentioned, not so good for predicting the response of polymers, plastics, et cetera. For metals, maybe, but not for polymers. Not the best idea. Kinematic hardening plasticity is very different. I mentioned this briefly earlier. The linear elastic response is here. The yield stress is this one here. And then you get the reverse plasticity at twice that value. And that's why it's linear elastic here. And then it starts to roll over, similar to this shape here. Very much uh, more interesting for polymer predictions. Well, what about kinematic hardening? This is where, where you have the you can tailor the response during unloading in an interesting way. We have the initial yield stress here. We have the final stress here. And then we get linear elastic until we get reverse the plasticity in my example down here. And this is now between the point where we would have reverse plasticity for isotropic hardening and kinematic hardening. And that's why it's called the, kinema the combined hardening type approach. So to illustrate this uh, in practice, here's some experimental data that I have for ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. There's experimental data on red, a tension test, three compression tests. And I have a Abacus elastic plastic combined hardening material model. I already calibrated it to this. So if I just click run once in M calibration, we can see the predictions from this model. This looks uh, reasonable in some ways. It kind of captures the essence of the shape of these curves. And this is the best overall fit that I could come up with. The details are not awesome. I mean, there's some errors in some spots and, and so forth, but it's clearly more uh, predictive in its capability compared to isotropic hardening plasticity. So therefore, this is something that I usually recommend if you have any cyclic loading or if you want to work with polymers generally because you have this ability to capture the properties that experimentally often occurs. So to summarize, a combined hardening plasticity is really an interesting combination of these two other types of plasticities, and it's often a little bit better. The one limitation of this type of model is that the tangent modulus, the slope of this curve, always is decreasing. You can't get it, make it go up towards the end, which is typically what you see in many polymers, uh, thermoplastics, and large strains that tend to do that because the molecules get really aligned and then become stiffer. So that's something that's experimentally seen, but not so much in this material model. So this is a limitation. But this type of plasticity model has the advantage that it runs really fast on your finite element program. People like that. Running fast is good. You can get results quicker. But keep in mind, they can also give you poor results if you don't do it carefully. It's not ever, I would say, the most accurate model. And finally, I think that these types of plasticity models are becoming less and less important these days because the viscoplasticity models that I've been talking about in some of my other videos tend to become more and more accurate as, as, as time goes on. It's easier to use. 
Uh, but this, this model is still available. There are occasions when this is very useful, so you should know about it. If you have any questions on this, you can ask them below.